Lovers, this episode is going to be a little different. If you're a regular listener, you know how much I love deep throating. If you're new, I fucking love deep throating. (laughs) I learned how to do it in the spring of 2017 and was trained by my then master pretty early on in our relationship. And when I learned to do it, I felt like I had gained a superpower. Now, I had previously thought that deep throat just meant that a penis was touching the back of my throat. I had no idea that it could actually go all the way inside. Uh, my porn exposure was limited. I, I find looking for it overwhelming. So, like, most of my porn experience has come from partners or friends sharing stuff they like with me. So, I loved deep throating because I felt like I would find this relaxation point with it. and. I feel just this deep level of excitement and heightened emotional pleasure when I do it. And especially because my first experience with it was with my first ever master, my only master to this date, my former master, formative experiences. So recently I started seeing a new lover, a daddy, and while our relationship's been pretty casual, we've had super duper hot sex, like really good sexual chemistry and just like like a really nice, easy, friendly relationship. And with him, I literally experienced a new angle of deep throating, which is to say I would lay on my back on the bed with my head hanging over the edge and he could throat fuck me that way. And I had so much fun doing it. Like he, yeah, I liked it. So deep throating basically puts me straight into subspace and it makes me just horny for more. (laughs) So I think it's relaxing. I think it's arousing. I love that it kind of not forces me to relax, but it helps me check in with my body in that way. And I just also feel very proud of myself, like very pleased. And probably probably that's some sort of submissive thing, but I'm just like, ah, yes, I'm doing this new skill, this superpower. So one of the things that I hear a lot from you listeners and By the way, I'm just so grateful for all of the nice things that you write to me. One of the things I hear a lot is that you like how curious and excited I am when I'm learning about other people's sex lives, and that it just, it feels like I'm experiencing and learning stuff right along with you. And I would say that feels pretty accurate to me. (laughs) So, do any of you have any experience with STIs? Do any of you out there have experience with the herpes simplex virus? HSV2? HSV2 is often known as genital herpes, but it's not necessarily. You can get it in your mouth. HSV1 is a more common form of oral herpes, and anyone who gets cold sores, which is a huge percentage of the population, has HSV1. So they're both herpes simplex virus. There are eight types total. HSV1 and HSV2 are the ones that I'm kind of focusing on right now. And both HSV1 and HSV2 can go either place in your mouth or lower down and other places on your body too, for the record. So I've been getting cold sores, HSV1, uh, around the edges of my mouth since I was a teenager. And Anytime I get stressed or kind of run down, I get a little tingle at the corners of my mouth. So for me, putting pure vanilla extract on that, like when as soon as I get a tingle, that really helps. Uh, I carry around a tiny little bottle in my backpack, which I use instead of a purse. So I don't know. It doesn't work for everybody. It really works well for me. And just last week, I discovered that the sore throat that I had that just wouldn't go away was not some form of viral strep, but was in fact is, in fact, HSV2. So today, as I'm recording this, it is the day before Thanksgiving. I feel okay today. I wrote all of these notes planning to do an episode or thinking maybe, I don't know if I'm ready to do an episode, the night that I found out I had it. And I felt incredibly vulnerable. I still feel vulnerable in this moment, but I also feel excited. And I feel vulnerable because the stigma is very real. And I thought that I, in some way, shape, or form, would be not immune to it, but I thought I'd get less affected. You know, will you still like how open I am if I'm admitting to you that I contracted an often sexually transmitted virus? Even in the course of learning a fuck ton doing this podcast and really, really being uncomfortably diligent about 
practicing my communication around safe sex, I still got it. So I'm excited because I think that together we can smash down some of the stigma. Every little bit helps, right? Now, if all of a sudden you don't like me or you think that I'm gross because I have throat herpes, I guess that's all the more reason to talk about it. Because it is honestly very silly and needs to change, and it won't until we all talk about it. So that's why I am excited for this episode. And it's not like I'm saying anything brand new here. I am just sharing my own personal story and throwing my little stick onto this herpes fire (laughs) in an effort to make a big bonfire so we could burn away sexual shame. There are a lot of people out there who are already doing amazing work and have been for ages around STIs and stigma. And if you go to sexstoriespodcast.com slash herpes, I'm going to link to some of the resources that have really helped me this past week and a half. And I just want to give a particular shout out to Ella Dawson, who is a great writer and has an article about how Time Magazine had an article in 1982 that basically created the stigma around herpes. So I highly recommend you go check it out. Now, in the back of your mind, you might be wondering why I was very diligent about explicit sexual communication. How did she get throat herpes? Well, I will tell you. It's possible to get herpes even if you have a conversation about sexual health. Even if you have two conversations about sexual health with the same partner. And a lot of the reactions that I've been getting when I tell friends that I contracted HSV2 in my throat have been anger at my partner. And I just want to first say, I don't know that that's totally appropriate. Yes, we should all do due diligence in keeping ourselves and our partners safe. That's very clear. And... I have compassion, and I just want to be really clear about the difference between, like, having compassion and not wanting to, like, shame and blame versus, like, actually trying to do the right thing and do your best. I have compassion because we live in a society where talking about STIs and sexual health, for some reason, is difficult. And it's bonkers because if you're the type of people that are going out and fucking then talking about it shouldn't be a big deal. I've been thinking a lot about this, and it's not like I have been this perfect, pristine person doing all the right things all the time. I've had unprotected sex. I've been really, really risky in the past, and I've just been fucking lucky. And I think the thing that finding out that I have HSV2 in my throat made me feel is, like, when I tell people that, they're going to think I'm some sort of careless slut. And that's just not true. I'm a very careful slut. I'm very, very careful. I'm not even that slutty. It depends on your own definition. I'm like proud slutty, if that makes sense. But I'm not going out to bang every single person I see. And no shame if you are that person. That's cool too. But all of the times that I was fine before, I was just lucky. I was just a lucky careless slut. (laughs) This time, I'm a less lucky careful slut. So I had multiple conversations with this partner about sexual health. There were things I didn't say. There were things I didn't ask. What I did say was something along the lines of, have you been tested recently? He said, no, he hadn't. I said, I was due for a test as well and was going to be doing that pretty soon. This was before we ever slept together. It was on our first date. He was driving me back to my car. We had made out a little bit, and I'd made it really clear that I was interested in being touched more by him. And that was when he'd revealed to me that he's into some kinky stuff and likes to be called daddy. And I was like, okay, let's let's try it. Let's see what happens. So we discussed protection. I said, cool. I suggested we both go get tested. And we agreed condoms were a good thing to use. Now, here's the thing. When I have sexual health conversations with people, I ask if they've had any symptoms, if they've had any STIs, I ask when they've been tested. And then for oral sex, I just assume that if I don't see anything, it's probably fine. And I, like many people, have heard out in the world, anecdotally, that it's so much harder to get stuff orally. And I will tell you how difficult it is (laughs) to 
to contract HSV too orally. It's one deep throat difficult. So I just want to put that into perspective. I know that using condoms for blowjobs is not a common thing. And I just want to say you are at risk. And you have to decide what level of risk you're okay with. So that was our first conversation around sexual health. And we used condoms, but not for blowjobs. Second conversation happened a few weeks later when we started doing anal. And he asked if, since it was my butt, if I was okay without a condom. And I said, no, I still want a condom. And he said, okay. And it wasn't an issue. And again, from my perspective, I'm like, well, I had two separate conversations about my sexual health. It should be very clear to him that that's very important to me. And I do wish that I had been told that he slept with somebody unprotected in between seeing me. And that's the part that I would ask him to do differently going forward because I believe that had he told me, hey, I slept with someone unprotected, I probably still would have said, okay, well, do you, how do you feel? Do you have any symptoms? And if he'd said no, I probably would have been like, all right, I'm still fine with oral stuff. But at least then it would have been my herpes that I chose, that I claimed that I had agency over. If does that make sense? I'm most upset because I wasn't given the option. I probably would have made the same choice because that is what I've been doing around oral sex. Now I'm going to be a lot more careful because I can trust myself to keep other people who don't have HSV2 safe. And I want to make sure that I'm doing that. So I actually also, this is hilarious. My short film that I just finished, Art is My Mistress from the Diary of Art Slut. You can go watch it if you go to my Instagram. It's in my link in bio. I actually contracted a herpes while I was finishing it. I was in post-production and my lover also helped me make the sound effects for it. So like, it's, I, I, don't know, I guess herpes is delightfully woven in in that way. Um, it's got a special, special spot burned into my heart for the rest of forever. But, you know, it's this thing where it's like I was doing post-production on that film. I was working on the sound and the color and he was like, can you hang out tonight? Can I, you know, can I use you? And I was like, no, I'm too busy working. And he's like, what if I come over? And I was like, okay, I can take a little break if you come here. And it's just funny because I wouldn't have gotten throat herpes if it wasn't for that. So again, when he came over, I didn't stop to ask him like, hey, have you slept with anyone since me? Because we'd been seeing each other once every other week or two and I felt a pretty good amount of trust and... I also just assume that people want to keep themselves safe. And it wasn't until a week and a half later that I heard from him and got a text message. And he was like, hey, how's it going? And I was like, oh, pretty good. I'm visiting a friend in Denver, but I just have this sore throat that will not go away. And then he was like, oh, are you around later to talk? And I was like, oh, shit, like we've never had a phone call. And my friend the night before had been talking about this cold sore she'd had when she was filming a commercial and how bad it was. And as soon as she said the word cold sore, some part of me was like, oh, shit, what if that's what this sore throat is? And it was almost like even before I heard from him and I only heard from him a few hours later, I some part of me already knew <laughs> what I was in for. Because let me just tell you throat herpes fucking hurts. My throat hurt so bad, it took all of my energy to focus on the conversations that I was having with people. I felt like I was a muted personality, like I had brain fog from the level of pain that I was in. And I didn't have any other symptoms. So oftentimes you can get a little fever, you can get other stuff, and that's also the same kind of symptoms that you can get for strep throat. But I only had a very bad sore throat, and the sore looked nasty. It was a big white sore in the back of my throat. But I also had some stripes on my tonsils, and my tonsils always look kind of crazy. They always have. They're very large. And so I was like, oh, I don't know. This should be going away soon. But it was like day nine of having a sore throat when I finally heard from him, and he let me know that he was having sores, and he suspected a herpes outbreak, although his tests had all come back negative. And I was like, okay. And I think I was the most furious that he took so long to tell me. So I just want to put this out there. I know that there's a school of thought that's like, well, if you don't know for sure, don't alarm your partners. I say go ahead and alarm your partners because 
you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know what level of pain or discomfort they're in. And I think as soon as you have any sort of symptoms, let them know. Because if I had gotten some antivirals sooner, I would have spent a lot less time in pain. I lost a lot of time in my life because I was in pain and I was so foggy and I wasn't able to function. And time is very important to me. So I'm just going to say that. So that is kind of my, my own herpes story. You can be diligent. And yeah, I could have been more diligent. It's also a ton of emotional labor to be the person that's always bringing up STI convos. So if you're a person that never does that, I invite you to change that practice. And I don't think it needs to be a bad thing. Think of it this way. You're looking out for a partner. You you don't want somebody that you care about. I don't care if you don't care about them a, a lot. If, you, if you're going to fuck them, I believe that you should have a certain amount of basic respect where it's like, hey, I don't want you to experience this painful thing. Plus all the stigma, plus all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at a basic level, it's just like, hey, let's make sure that we don't have to experience any unnecessary discomfort. Have the fucking conversation. That discomfort is fine. If it becomes a normal thing, it will go away. It will only become a normal thing if we make it the cool thing to do. You are a cool person when you have that conversation. When you don't have the conversation, for me, it's now a red flag. And I will ask my future lovers why I had to be the one to initiate it. <laughs> Unless I lead with it, which I might, which also might not go well because I don't know. We'll see. So... <sighs> That was a lot in itself, and I had a tiny meltdown because the feelings were very real. I was angry and had, like, I was angry at him, but then I felt, like, bad for feeling angry at him because I also understand how his behavior is pretty normal in our culture. And again, if he had unprotected sex with someone, I wish he'd told me. But also, when you're not having symptoms, and that's the thing about herpes, it's very sneaky. You can be asymptomatic. Most people get it from an asymptomatic partner. A lot of people never have an outbreak until they discover they've had it from a test. So it's a very, very, very sneaky virus. And I had anger that was then like tempered by this feeling of guilt that I was angry because uh, I know better than to f suffer from the shame and the stigma like I do in my brain logically. I And I I was like, I don't know if I can talk about this on the podcast. I don't want to tell anybody. But then, you know what? I had to tell somebody immediately. And I did. I started telling. Luckily, I was with a friend. I was staying at a friend's house. And so I told her right away. And I was just like sobbing on the floor of the bathroom. And I called my best friend. And she was like, it's okay. You know, and so I, again, was very lucky to be surrounded by supportive humans. And then I texted my friend who we're going to hear from who's in medical school and also has HSV-1 genitally. And I was like, what do I do? I don't know, the mess. I slept with my lover and contracted herpes on a Monday. And the following Friday, so four days later, I had coffee with my former master. We met at a coffee shop. We'd been talking a little bit. And I kept inviting him to go back to my place. I'm like, if we're seeing each other, you you know you're going to want to touch me like we are the basis of our relationship is sexual like let's just let's just let it be that and he kept being like no 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 if we see each other i want things to be different and i'm like cool different can be you change your behavior like you can still come touch me so we had coffee things were going well and i was like all right i got to go bake a cake for my friend's birthday do you want to come back and touch me while i do it and so he he was uh he was going down on me. He was touching me. He was, I don't know what was happening. His fingers were inside. The cake was pristine. I kept the, the counter area while I was mixing the ingredients pristine. Um, but it was very fun to be mixing the ingredients and have a person just like touching me in all the ways that I love. And when it came time to add the eggs to the batter, I had forgotten to bring them to room temperature. So we decided that we would put them in a bowl of hot water and set a timer for 10 minutes and then went and fooled around on my couch. So it was during that time he was going down on me, pleasuring me, all these things. And I was like, be inside me. And he was like, no, no, let's wait. Like, let's not be hasty. And I was like, can I have your cock in my mouth? And he said yes to that. So at that point, I had just the very, very beginnings of a slightly scratchy throat. But I have kind of a shitty immune system and have sore throats often. I have to be very careful if I 
don't get enough sleep, if I eat too much sugar, if I drink a drop of alcohol, I get a sore throat and a sniffly nose. So I thought because I had just cooked food for this retreat and made a short film and booked this TV show and had been going nonstop for a few weeks and like I stay up late editing these podcasts last minute, like I'm just, you know, I'm doing too many jobs. So I thought I was just overextended and had a little sore throat and I was taking all the vitamins and I was getting plenty of sleep and I was like, I'm going to be so fine, like I'm finally getting caught up on life. But I exposed him to HSV2. So when I found out, I had to immediately contact him and let him know what was happening. And I was like, hey, if you've had any other lovers, please let them know immediately because I wish my lover had let me know sooner. And he was like, oh, yeah, I do have a few people to follow up with. And I was like, a few? Like, how many people did you see in a week? He's like, well, there was a threesome and another one-off. And so I was like, please tell them right away. And he's like, I'm not having any, any symptoms. And I was like, that doesn't matter. You were definitely exposed. You may not have it. You could be, you could remain asymptomatic but you could have passed it to them. So please let them know. So he says he did, but that just goes to show like it's, it's a sneaky virus and it gets passed sneakily. And I know that I was lulled into the feeling of blowjobs are safe. Mouth stuff is fine. So feelings, I dropped off a cliff for a week emotionally. I found out on Saturday, November 16th, and I was just in a dark place. I was in a sad place. I did feel like my sexual self had been taken away from me. I felt completely turned off. Like I felt like I would never feel desirable again. I felt repulsive. I felt contaminated. And then I had a whole other layer of shame that I even felt any of those feelings because I know better. And I had this clear moment where I was like, well, it's a whole lot easier to like fight the stigma when you're outside of it. I just let myself cry. I didn't sleep very much that first night. I went to a birthday party of a friend of a friend because I was like, well, I guess I'll still go. Or we were like, we were like dressed and on our way to the party when I got the call from the doctor. And I, again, I was in Denver, so I was traveling. So then when I, I missed the call and I tried to call the doctor back, but because it's Kaiser, you can't get a direct line. And then because I was out of state, they didn't recognize my like medical record number. And then I had to like, basically it took me an hour from the time that I missed the doctor's phone call to actually get someone on the phone. And this lady was very, like, I think she just is old-fashioned and and carries a lot of that stigma. And she was just like, well, you've tested positive for HSV-2. And I was surprised, but not shocked, but also shocked. And I was just like, okay, well, uh, uh, what, you know, what, what else do I need to know? And she's like, well, you can, it says here you're leaving town tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, she's like, you can come into the pharmacy and pick up your prescription. And I was like, well, what is my prescription? She's like, acyclovir. And I was like, okay, well, what time does the pharmacy open? She was like, 8 a.m. And I was like, okay, well, what else do I need to know? And she like paused for a second. Like I just asked her the most annoying question. She's like, well, HSV2 is a virus, so you'll have it forever. It'll never go away. And I was just like, okay, thank you. Goodbye. Like it was the least helpful <laughs> lady. So that that didn't help. But then I luckily was I had friends. I started just telling everyone I know. I have a group of lady friends that I talked to on Marco Polo. I told them via a Marco and I was just crying during it. I just started sharing that with people. And I will say by the time I got to last Friday, I felt a shift. I felt different. I don't know if it's because we moved from Scorpio to Sagittarius on that day, but I felt like something had lifted and I spent the whole week going really slowly, feeling really sad, wondering what my future was going to be like <laughs> sexually and just feeling weird and just acknowledging that and crying when I needed to and also reminding myself that it was okay, but it was also okay to not feel okay. So that was it. I found out 10 days ago I had a lot of deep sadness. I also was in a bit of a brain fog and had trouble connecting with people on a very basic level. I tried to cancel plans with a couple of friends. And I, I will say it was really nice to hear. One of them was just like, because I told them, I was like, I have HSV2 and I just feel like I need to curl up into a small ball and be alone and cry. And one of my good friends was like, can I just ask you not to cancel on us? Like it was like her and her husband. And 
she was like, I don't, I respect if that's what you really need to do, but just come over like we planned. Let's hang out. We'll make you laugh, like, or, or you can cry or whatever, like whatever comes up is fine. And that reassurance meant so much to me. Like it, it meant so much to share these things with friends who are relatively conservative in some ways, or moderately conservative at least, more so than a lot of my friends in Los Angeles. And just just to feel that acceptance and to feel that love and to feel like, no, it's okay, you're still a person. Like, obviously I am. It's literally just a virus. It is a skin thing. Yes, you can pass it through sex. You can pass a lot of things through sex. So the more I share it, the more I frame it as this like very physically painful experience I had, plus all of the painful emotional feelings of shame and feeling horrible, I've gotten really compassionate responses from people. And I'm not just sharing with my best friends. I'm pretty much telling anyone who will listen in an environment that's relatively appropriate, hey, this is, this is what I'm dealing with right now because it's just very present for me. And I know that not everyone is lucky enough to have such open, loving friendships. So I thought I would take this episode to share a handful of supportive humans who really helped me with you guys. So this episode has three guests, a therapist, a soon-to-be doctor, and a sex worker. And we are covering stigma, physical health, and approaches to conversations around STIs. Lovers, with me now, I have Ryan Jacobs. He's going to introduce himself. Hi, guys. My name is Ryan Jacobs. I'm a psychotherapist working in New York City. I specialize in the LGBTQ population as a affirmative therapist, but I use several other different modalities, too. Awesome. And can you share with us some of your experience around STIs and the stigma that comes with them, as you've seen in your clients? I see the stigma a lot. I see a lot of shame. I see a lot of STIs really evoke negative core beliefs. I think if there are negative core beliefs, you have sort of internalized, connected to whatever part of yourself. Sexual stuff can get brought up a lot and STIs can really exacerbate those negative beliefs, which is so unfortunate because, you know, if the feeling is, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm, I'm less than, the STI can unfortunately affirm that belief, which I see a lot in clients. And they come to me and they're really sort of down on themselves. And there's a lot of self-blame and a lot of sort of like this behavior has led to this thing that I I deserve this. There's a lot of, you know, cultural stuff, religious stuff. So I see it a lot, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. When I told my therapist, I was like, I'm not going to bury the lead. I have throat herpes. Yeah. And, and we went from there. And I, I did have a lot of those things that you just identified. How are people typically telling you? Do they, I know it depends on the person, it, but it, can it, you just it, give us a little range? It depends on the person. What I found is it's always the worst the first time. There's always the most amount of shame the first time. There's always hedging the first time. I recently had a client in a group I run. I run a gay men's group. And mm-hmm. he sort of disclosed months after he, he came in and said, I, I really wanted to tell you guys something for months. Here's the thing that happened to me. And I, I contracted like two STIs from this sexual encounter that I had previously told you guys about. And I haven't told you because I've been so ashamed and I've been so angry at myself. And group was just like, why didn't you tell us? Like, why mm. didn't you tell us? We talk about these things all the time. Other members disclose all the time. But it was his first ever contraction of anything. And he really, even with everyone else in group sharing their experiences all the time, even in the last few months, his internal belief was like he couldn't share it. He was holding on to it in this really, really negative way. So the first time it's really hard, but I have clients now who, with gay men especially, who I work with primarily, STIs are really up. I think STIs are really up everywhere with the use of PrEP and, you know, sort of condoms becoming less of a requirement for a lot of people. So the more normalized it gets, the more my clients feel free to talk about it. And I have clients come in and say, you know, I can track to something else. It's sort of annoying. You know, this is this is what's going on. So it it changes for people, which I think is encouraging when they when their relationship with the changes and it becomes less of this like 
stigmatized hidden thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm feeling that in myself after just a week and a half of learning that I have HSV2 in my throat, like the first week I was like, oh, fuck, I yeah. hate everything. Yeah. And I already feel that this shift happening inside of me. Why is that happening? Yeah. Like, what is going on? Is it just my brain chemistry being like, oh, you're fine now? It's it's really normalizing. You've, you've yeah. formalized it in your mind as this an experience that people have, and this is happening to you, and it's a normal experience. And I think that's key. And again, it's taking away all that stigma and all those previously held beliefs about this thing, this thing that we've built in our minds that this is bad or this is scary or if this happens to me, I'll never, I'll never be the same. I'll never recover. And then it happens and it's like, oh, this is just an experience I'm having. And my brain, like you said, you know, sort of wraps around it and, and creates a different experience around it and, and reframes it really so you can live with it. Yeah, it's it is wild. So when you are supporting the people that you work with, mm -hmm. where do you start? I know and I know I'm generalizing because obviously it depends on the person and everyone yeah. is different. But what's you know, if you, if we have listeners out there that are like, oh, I just had a friend tell me this and I don't know how to support them. Where do you begin? I would really begin with normalizing it, thanking that person or acknowledging that you appreciate them telling you, but also normalizing it and, and saying that it's really nothing to be ashamed of. It's really nothing to hide. It's really nothing to hold. I mean, I always tell my clients, the secrets we keep from everyone, the secrets we keep inside ourselves are what really poisons us. And the more we hold on to these things, the, the worse it can be. So telling people, I encourage them to tell their friends, tell, tell your friends at brunch. You know what I mean? This is what happened to me, guys. This is what happened to me, you know, roommate, best friend, because okay, this is an experience I'm sharing with other people. It's not something I'm going to carry around with me and, and yeah. really make myself feel worse for. Yeah. And so that's that's where I start, normalizing it. In, in the room, really creating a space to say, let's talk about this. What are your feelings about it? How do you think this changes you? Does it change you? And, and mm -hmm. inevitably, some people think it does. And then sort of backtracking those negative thoughts to say, no, it doesn't change you. It's just an experience you're having. Yeah. When you were talking about stigma earlier, you mentioned the prevalent use of PrEP. Can you talk a little bit about anything you've noticed in terms of how stigma maybe is shifting from STI to STI? Absolutely. I've noticed such a huge change. A few years ago, even like four years ago even, which is a, a relatively really short time, Yeah. Um, I had clients who were HIV positive who we talked so much about disclosure, the disclosure of telling someone you're positive and the immense anxiety and fear of I'm going to go on a date with this person. They're going to, I'm going to like them. They're going to reject me because of my status. Mm -hmm. And PrEP has really changed that. Just being positive and being on PrEP, like it's so different now. I have HIV positive clients who have, you know, their whole dynamic has shifted. They don't think about it. They don't stress about it you know, people they're disclosing to are like, oh yeah, I'm on prep. No, no problem. It, it's really shifted in the way that people are fearful of HIV, where it's really not this gigantic, scary thing anymore. That being said, the, you know, the lessening of the HIV anxiety and the lessening of the use of condoms has really increased the use of other STIs. And yeah. now there's, anxiety within that disclosure because more people are testing positive for things and there's the inevitable like do i have to tell former partners how many do i have to tell? how far do i have to go back can i do it anonymously oh, so i talk about that yeah. those are great questions what do people land on with how far back do i go assuming someone's very sexually active it's it's a tough call and and i talk to a lot of people who have you know more random encounters so it's like yeah. do i do I contact the guy on Grinder who I, you know, didn't really get his name and we had this exclusive experience, like this fun experience, but do I go back on Grinder and like message him? Oh yeah. And so there's a lot of questions there around like how do I do it? And and I sort of always just say, Well, what would you want someone to do for you? Like how 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 would you receive this news if someone on Grinder who you hooked up with said, Hey, I test positive for this thing, you might want to get tested. It's sort of a nice gesture if yeah. you think about it. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. It takes a lot of, you know, it takes a lot to put yourself out there and say, hey, guess what? 
I'm, I'm disclosing this to you. Um, and overall, the clients I see most, the message I get most is I wish people were more honest with me. I wish, I wish people were more communicative with me. So that's sort of, I think that's always a safe place to go. More communication, more honesty. Oh, you're speaking my language. That is what I want for all of us. I, I do yeah. think that if we had more of that, then that's the shift that we need to uh, to steer away from those things. I, I think it would be a very different, a very different world if we had those things. Yeah. Okay. So if a listener out there is like, okay, that's fine. I want to support. I want to normalize. But like, mm. I'm not going to fuck a person who has those things. What might you say to them? What might you offer? Um, that's such an interesting perspective because I'm I'm so used to going for the advocacy side of the totally. who's in play who who has the thing and oh, that's such a good question. I I would say I would challenge that. I would say I would say what what's your belief around that thing and how it makes that person a different person? I would really challenge it because it doesn't. And that's sort of the frame I use with my clients. If someone rejects you, if someone says, you know what, you disclosed this thing to me and I really can't enter into any sort of physical or intimate relationship with you, I, I always say to my clients, then they're saving you. You don't want to be in a relationship with that person. If that's, the, if that's their barrier to you connecting with you, that connection is not one you want anyway. That's exactly what I'm landing on right now. And I'm still in this space where I'm feeling nervous about talking to new people. Yeah, I think it's hard. What do you notice in your clients when they get out there and start talking to people the, for the first time? Like, is it easier after they talk to one or what happens? <laughs> Tell me my it's, future. That's your job, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. I think that's what a lot of people think. Coming to a therapist, yes. you're my. Tell, tell me what to do. And, oh and, my gosh, it. that's it. Is funny actually. I will. I just want to sidebar the number of times that I've heard from people. Well, what does your therapist say? Mm. And I'm like, well, my therapist asks me good questions, and we like talk about it together. Like it's not like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my think, therapist is different from common, a master. Yeah, I think it's a common misconception of like going to a therapist they're just going to tell you what to do and it's just it's so much different than that it's really the exploration of you mm -hmm. and the person just facilitating that exploration yeah i i think the disclosure it's a sort of domino effect there's that first initial that's mainly what i see that's usually how it happens there's there's the anxiety of how do i do it what do i do and then the eventual sort of opening up of okay the first one went sort of well and Oh, well, the second one went well, and oh, the third one went well. And so there's, I, I think that builds confidence and again, normalizes it to say, oh, this isn't the situation I've built in my mind, or this isn't, again, the, the negative belief that I have held for so long around this thing. It, it's different and it restructures it in my mind. And I always say, you know, I always encourage those great experiences and I'm always, I always really applaud them and say, look, see, this is, this is so great to have this experience with this person or, you know, they, they took it well. And inevitably people will have a, a bad experience. And that's when I go back to that, that person's just not supposed to be in your life for whatever reason. And this is the way they're telling you. And, and if this wasn't the reason they would tell you in another way at a different time yeah, and, yeah. and to really just let them go and focus on the positive. I mean, focus on the, focus on the disclosures that feel positive. Do you have any other words out there to inspire our listeners when it comes to STIs or shame or therapy in general? I would really encourage people to not go in on themselves. I, I see that so much with STIs, with everything else, just the providing evidence of negative beliefs. We all have negative beliefs. And I think STI contraction is is a real straight shot to this negative core belief center to say, oh, this, you know, here's confirmation that I'm bad or I'm not good. And I, I would really encourage people to, as much as they can, steer away from that because it's it's not helpful. And that experience, I think, is difficult enough without our added stuff. I think that's a hard thing to do. But I would encourage people to reframe as much as they can. This is an experience I'm having based on other experiences I've had, just as all experiences are sort of connected. And this is a new experience to explore that I can learn from. I can really learn from and I can learn about myself. And another experience that 
eventually will change in my mind and I'll look back on it and say, you know, hopefully I've learned something from this and, and I'm going to, and I'm going to pass that knowledge on to other people or change other people's perspectives. Ryan, thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. I'm, I'm so happy to talk to you. Where can people find you? People can find me at ryanjacobstherapy.com. My email is ryan at ryanjacobstherapy.com. Okay, if you're in the New York area, you know where to find him. So when I first got the information that I had HSV2, I freaked out. And luckily, I have a friend who is a medical professional. So I'm introducing to you Dr. S., who is finishing up medical school and also has HSV1 genitally. Welcome. Hi, Maya. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Uh, Thank you for being here. And thank you for your deep dive research when I was in the midst of a freakout because that really calmed me down. And I want to share some of that info with our listeners. So let's do a herpes crash course. And can you just tell us a little bit about HSV1 and HSV2? Okay, so... HSV1 and HSV2 are two types of viruses from the herpes virus family. There's eight different types of virus that we know of in this family. Super common, about 100% of people have had herpes virus 6, which is really common in infancy. Oh, really? Causes like fever, diarrhea, rash kind of thing goes away. And then, you know, there's also Epstein-Barr virus, which is known as like the one of the main causes for mono yeah mononucleosis so if you've ever had mono that's probably a herpes virus <laughs> i have had yeah. mono so really it's, it's, yeah yeah so it's uh there's a lot of variability in the viruses in this family but the two most common are hsv1 and hsv2 so hsv is herpes simplex virus oh and also just throw this in there chicken pox is a herpes virus so okay most of us I've had that too as well. Um, now there's a vaccine, which is pretty cool. Yeah, HSV1 and HSV2 are known as like the herpes, the herp <laughs> kind of thing. So it was traditionally thought of as HSV1 just infects the mouth, HSV2 just infects the genitals. But we know now that either of these viruses can infect pretty much any part of your body. Anywhere that you have skin, anywhere that you have a mucous membrane, these viruses can get in and cause infection. And you and I both know that personally, because I have HSV2 in my mouth, in my throat, and you have HSV1 generally. Yeah, so we're kind of experts. Not so rare. They speculate that the rise of oral sex is contributing. I'm pretty sure oral sex has been happening for millennia, so who knows about that. But (laughs) (laughs) But really, you know, it's super common. We know that Roughly 60% or more adults have HSV-1, and when we're looking at rates of HSV-2, it's probably closer to 15 to 30% of adults. Those statistics vary depending on where you are, North America versus Africa, like you're going to see different distributions of these viruses. But in general, as you can see, these viruses are super common. So they're super common. And let's just talk a little bit about how they actually work. So I have it in my throat. What does that mean? Is it going to go somewhere else? Okay, so these viruses are sneaky little buggers, Mm -hmm. and they can get in anywhere, (laughs) pretty much. So in addition to what we typically think of when we think of herpes, which is mouth and genitals, herpes virus can actually infect anywhere on the body. Like literally anywhere. Like my fingertips? Like your fingers. I don't know about fingertips specifically. (laughs) Fingers, your eyes, the esophagus, pretty much any of your skin. And I actually found in this deep dive (laughs) of research that I did that, and this is something that they don't teach us in medical school, Mm -hmm. but there is an infection called herpes gladiatorum, which is like a fantastic name, but it's associated with contact sports where It's typically you think of like rugby or wrestlers Mm -hmm. um, where they're having a lot of close contact and they can get herpes virus anywhere on their skin. Um, It has actually caused like crazy outbreaks of wiped out entire wrestling teams. Oh, wow. They all get it. And so, you know, your shoulder, your your trunk area, like anywhere on your skin. It's not just limited to the mouth. And the fun parts. <laughs> okay. And so can you talk a little bit about why herpes, when a person has it, they tend to have it in one place? And will it stay there? And why does it stay in a place? And 
Can you tell us a little bit about nerve distributions and things like that? that? That's exactly it. So when you get infected with the herpes virus, you have the initial infection, but then it also, you know, gets into the nerve root essentially. And so anywhere that nerve distributes, you can get a recurrence. So like, say for example, you have a spot on your chest. So in your spinal cord, there's going to be a little home that the virus lives in that provides nerve distribution to like basically all across from your back, all the way in front of your chest. So it can pop up anywhere there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we see that actually a lot more commonly with shingles, which is herpes zoster, which is a recurrence of, you know, the chicken pox herpes virus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it lives in that nerve root and Anytime the environment is right for a recurrence to happen, it can happen anywhere along that distribution. So it's kind of hard to predict, but most people have recurrences in the same spot over and over. Okay, so I'm interested in learning information about myself for myself. Do I need to worry about my throat spreading to the rest of my mouth or like if I poke my throat? and then touch my eye, how likely is it that I will then get eye herpes? Can I auto-inoculate myself? Yeah, so auto-inoculation is where basically you can spread the virus from where it's initially infected to another part of your body. That's supplied by a different nerve distribution. Mm -hmm. And using your example, mouth to eye, it's more common for that to happen in the initial infection. Okay. So Um, I'm at the tail end of my first outbreak. So I'm still kind of in the danger zone. Yeah, I would say so. Like you have to, you have to be really careful about hand hygiene and what you're touching when you're touching it. It basically is because your body hasn't yet um, created the antibodies mm-hmm. that are going to fight the virus and prevent you from getting it in other areas of your body. But once those antibodies are created and circulating and doing their job, patrolling for the herpes virus, the, the chances of you auto inoculating are very, very low. Okay. That's not to say it's impossible, but it's pretty, pretty low. And just a quick aside with the eyes, if you have the herpes virus living in the trigeminal ganglia, there's a possibility that it can, you can have a recurrence in your eye because it's supplied by those nerves. Wait, so am I understanding? So trigeminal ganglia, is that attached to my throat so I could get it in my eye anyway? Or what, what do you mean? (laughs) I don't get it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So the trigeminal ganglion, where we typically think that the herpes virus, when you have it orally, where it kind of goes and lives, that supplies a lot of the nerves of the face, including nerves that supply the eye. Okay. So potentially you can have a recurrence in your eye, not from auto inoculation, not because you, because it's just because that's where it comes up. And if you do have any eye symptoms when you're having an outbreak or any like weird stuff, get, go and see a doctor right away. You don't mess with the eyes. Yeah because that can cause some permanent damage. So you definitely want to make sure that you are getting that treated ASAP. Okay. And I want to know a little bit about the future of my blowjob life. <laughs> okay. Like, like yeah. or, or kissing in general, because I basically cut off all relationships because I freaked out. Like I did freak out a little bit and I was just like, I can't deal with, like, I'm just not ready to sort of, have my first disclosure conversation with a new person and even with the one of the guys that I was seeing I just like can't I'm too uh I'm finding that I'm hyper anxious right now about even any sort of kissing even when I finish this outbreak yes that is totally normal reaction I can tell you I went through the same exact anxieties I didn't have sex with anyone for like three years three years (laughs) I can't wait that long (laughs) It took a long time. Well, and, you know. I'll just let them fuck me down below and ball gag me or something. Like, maybe I need to find someone that's, like, only into ball gags. And so then my mouth is just never operational. Some latex rubber stuff. Just cover everything. (laughs) I guess that's true. Yeah. I was talking to a dude about latex play a little while ago. Maybe I should hit him up. Hey. (laughs) Hey, timing-wise, it'd be great right now. (laughs) So, but in terms of shedding and the risk of infecting your partner, 
We know that the greatest risk happens during the initial infection. You don't have antibodies yet. You It's a pretty gnarly infection and it, it just sheds like crazy. Yeah. Lots of virus particles being like in your, in your mouth, in your saliva, that kind of thing. So obviously initial outbreak, kind of want to avoid any sort of actions that could, you know, sharing sharing um, saliva, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Over time, we know that the frequency and the intensity of the outbreaks diminish. And some people, even, you know, after a certain number of years, don't have any outbreaks that they're even aware of. Mm-hmm. But that's not to say that they aren't shedding. That's not to say that they aren't shedding, which is true. In the case of oral HSV2, which is what you have, I found this, you know, there's this really great study in the BMJ, it's one of the medical journals, where they looked specifically at oral shedding of HSV2, and they found that it occurs very, very rarely. So when we're looking at rates of shedding, we know that HSV preferentially infects the oral cavity. And for some reason, we don't know exactly why yet, HSV-1 prefers living in those nerves Mm -hmm. as compared to living in the nerves down below your Mm -hmm. sacral ganglia for genital lesions, for example, and vice versa for HSV-2. It just prefers those nerves down below than it does in the mouth. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have HSV-2 in the mouth, you're going to have far less rates of recurrence and shedding than you will for HSV-1 in the mouth. And this study that I looked at in the BMJ also showed that the rates of shedding for HSV2 orally is way less than HSV2 shedding rates genitally. Okay. So So because it's not in the home that it likes to live in, it's not going to be as active. Okay. And so that means possibly fewer outbreaks? Yeah, that's, that is the hope. Um, And that's typically what we see. HSV2 orally is pretty rare. And, you know, I think part of that is because a lot of people get cold sores and a lot of times you're not getting those swabbed and tested to yeah. see what they are. Which one they are. Common. I'm wondering if possibly we're, it's underdiagnosed. Yeah. To have HSV2 orally. Well, and when I was trying to Google things about HSV2 in the throat, and thank God for you, otherwise I would have just been totally freaked out because everything I read said highly unlikely, nearly impossible unless you have HIV, AIDS, or cancer or a similarly immunocompromised body. And I was like, like I got mono when I was 16 and I, I have to be careful with my health because... It is, it's somewhat compromised, but I'm not like, I don't have to live in a bubble, you know? Oh, is that mean to say? I'm just saying like, I don't have to be so, so careful that I can't live a normal life. But now I'm wondering what sort of changes I might need to make to just make sure that I am totally healthy. I don't yeah. Know. When I was initially researching this myself, I got very frustrated because when you search throat herpes, it takes you down this rabbit hole of being immunocompromised. Yeah having HIV or AIDS. But I think that happens because of it's, it's ter- comes down to terminology and using the right words. And when we're thinking about throat herpes, there you're looking at two different things. You're looking at the oropharyngeal space, which is like, you know, in the mouth, kind of like the, just the back of the throat, pretty up in still in your head yeah versus esophageal herpes yeah is in your esophagus going to your digestive tract that is actually what is associated with hiv aids cancer etc okay well here's a question yes how do i know because i was deep throating that is how i got this herpes <laughs> yeah. how do i know how far down of it like i mean i felt the most of the pain here but right. i can't see down there so how do i um, you would have symptoms more far d- farther down in your chest. You okay. probably have chest pain, potentially heartburn type symptoms. Okay, I didn't have that. Okay, you can't have that. And really, we only see esophageal herpes in, for the most part, in immunocompromised patients. Okay. Um, what I think that you were experiencing is so a lot of the times with oral HSV infections, whether it's one or two, whatever type it is, the initial infection doesn't present actually as your typical cold sore on the lip thing that we're used to associating with with 
oral herpes. Yeah. It's actually, you get what's called a gingivostomatitis, which is just a fancy way of saying you get sores all up in your mouth and your throat. Yeah. It, where it happens all over. It can, it just like is flourishing inside your mouth. Mine was at the back of my throat. I sent you that gross picture. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and that is the same area. That's, that's considered your oropharyngeal region. Okay. And a lot of people get HSV-1 infections orally in childhood. And there are also a lot of other childhood illnesses that cause those types of gingivostomatitis symptoms, right. a lot of sores all over the mouth. So that could easily be confused for a number of different viruses that can cause those types of lesions, at, you know, as a kid. As an adult, we're paying more attention. <laughs> we can describe what's going on in our body. I speculate that adults who get HSV orally in adulthood, that the initial infection could be just confused for any other cause of a sore throat because, you know, not everybody is taking high quality pics of the back of their throat. You know what I mean? Well, and I would not have thought of it. Here's what happened. I was visiting a friend in Denver. She was telling me about a bad cold sore she'd had when she was filming a commercial a couple weeks prior. As soon as I heard the word cold sore, I was like, oh, I bet I have herpes in my throat. And then it was the next day, like just a few hours later, that my lover reached out to me and was like, how's it going? And I was like, my throat hurts. And he was like, let's talk. And mm -hmm. so it was this very, you know, but if that hadn't happened, I never would have thought to ask the doctor to check for herpes. I just wouldn't have thought of it because that's not where my brain went first. <laughs> you, know? Exactly. you know, and I think that that could be a reason that a lot of people aren't diagnosing their primary infections yeah. at the time that they happen because there are so many other more common causes for a sore throat. You know, there's other viruses, there's strep infections, and those are much more common. And the lesions, the HSV blistering lesions or ulcers can hide. And if you're not doing a thorough examination or if you're not doing an exam at the time that they're present, yeah. you might miss it. And mm -hmm. then eventually it goes away. And then typically the recurrent infections are your more common cold sore type things that okay. we see all the time. I'm still just so obsessed with like, can I kiss? Can I share food? Can I do the, you know, I'm, I'm obviously hyper vigilant right now because I just this morning took my last pill, like my last from my 10 day dosage. And I'm like, okay, in theory, according to everything I've read, they're like, oh, two days after your outbreak. But I'm like, when does an outbreak count as finished? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so I'm not finding much on like, when is it considered finished, like the outbreak? Yeah. But in the first year after your initial infection is when you are more likely to shed, more likely to have recurrences. Mm-hmm just because your body's still figuring out how to fight off this yeah. infection. It's like, what is this? Go away. I want yeah. to circle back yeah. to something you said earlier about yeah. the creation of antibodies. And if I'm understanding or remembering correctly, in blood tests, that's what they use to test for herpes, correct? They're checking antibodies. But that can take four to six months. It can take a while, right? Yeah, and that's actually what happened with me is culturing the sore itself is notoriously unreliable whether you actually get any active virus on that swab and mm -hmm. it gets cultured and it grows so i mean and that is one way to test for, for the virus but another way is to check your antibody mm -hmm. uh, levels so and we can actually with those levels type it and you can know specifically whether it's hsv1 or hsv2 mm -hmm. in my case my, my initial culture came back negative Oh, really? Um, Your swab? Yeah, the swab. So it oh. might have been that, you know, by the time I saw a doctor, it wasn't shedding enough virus particles for it to be cultured. Okay. Or they just didn't do a good job swabbing. Okay. Because you really have to get in there. Yeah, because that's that's what they did to me, and it hurt so fucking bad. Oh, yeah. oh my fucking. God, it hurt. I was like, I, ah. <laughs> I feel bad when I have to do it to patients. I'm like, I know this hurts. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you really have to get in there to get a good sample. And then in terms of the blood test, so for me, it took me 16 weeks before I had a positive blood test. Oh, and my God. 
So that whole time I was having recurrent infections, I was also under like tons of stress at the time. And I'd had several blood tests leading up to that point. So, you know, just depending on how long it takes for those circulating antibody levels to build up to a point where we can actually see it in the blood test, it, it can take a while for you to get like legit confirmation of the infection. So I'm going to be hyper vigilant about auto inoculation just for a few months. <laughs> Fair. Like just in case. Cause you don't yeah. know, you don't know where the antibody, like you, it's you, we just don't know. Is that accurate? I mean, I'm not, not that I'm going to like deep throat anyone and have them go unprotected into my vagina, but you know, like, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, everybody's a little bit different and right. tests, or tests aren't perfect. Yeah. Um, we get false positives and false negatives. That's not, it, it happens. So yeah. be vigilant, advocate for your health. Um, if you're not getting an answer, you just, that's what I had to do. I had to be persistent and keep asking for these tests because a lot of physicians aren't actually going to automatically test for herpes. Yes, um, because it's it is, hard yeah. to get them to test for herpes sometimes. It is, hard. it is hard. It's not part of the standard STD, STI panel. Why is one. that? Is it a money thing? No, it, well, you know, it's it's so common and most adults have HSV-1 mm-hmm. and they may have never even had a symptom from it. Mm-hmm. You know, may have never even had an outbreak. They just, you know, got the infection in childhood and they have the circulating antibodies and they're chilling, yeah. you know. So, you know, sometimes it's it's it does more harm to the patient to test for this and it comes back positive and they're like, oh my gosh, when did I get this? I've never had a symptom. Did my partner cheat on me? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And, you know, really can't always tell from the test when you got the infection. Right. And I think that's such a great point. Also, I just want to pause there and that mode of thinking to me seems like it still is stigma and shame based because if we had a different operation in society, if it was like, oh, I have this thing too, like a lot of other people, then it wouldn't theoretically cause harm to the patient because it would be just like, you know, it'd be as destigmatized as, say, chickenpox is. Right. Some of it may be a holdover from the more paternalistic times yeah. that we're still, we're still coming out of. But it's also, you know, if you don't have symptoms that fit with a typical herpes infection or you're not showing any symptoms at all and you're just doing a standard every so often STI test, it is expensive. Yeah. It's and there there's just a lot of factors that go into why it's not standard STD test. Mm -hmm. Again, like you you'll have to push for it if you really want it, if you're really suspecting that that could be the cause of symptoms you're having. Mm -hmm. On that same note, I had a follow-up phone call appointment with a doctor who's in my healthcare network. I'm with Kaiser. And so I was traveling in Colorado and went to a Kaiser urgent care. And it was a whole fucking run around because I had to like call and get a travel number and like make sure my insurance was covered. And then I found out my insurance had been canceled because something happened with their auto payment system. And so I had to get that sorted. You know, so it was like this whole like on top of the fact that I was like on day three of four of pain that was like making my brain foggy, like where it was like hard for me to be present and focus on words that my friend who I was visiting was saying. I was like trying to deal with the like bureaucratic side of things. And that was that was tough. So they ended up prescribing me a cyclovir and I got a 10 day dose, which I just finished today. And I had a follow up call with another doctor to check in about next steps and recommendations. And I was interested in suppressive therapy. So I wanted to find out about that. And this doctor told me that they will not prescribe me any sort of suppressive therapy until I have three outbreaks in a year. Mm. And I said, I'm not comfortable with that because I hope to never have another outbreak again. And I also hope to be able to be intimate with partners. And I want more information about, you know, I want to do everything I can to reduce my shedding rates and to reduce their rates of risk because I have a partner who probably wants to fuck me in the throat again (laughs) in spite of the risk. And I'm not comfortable with that yet, but this doctor was just like, nope, we don't do that. So I feel like that might be Kaiser being very sneaky about how they want to use insurance. I don't know. What is that normal? 
Yeah, I, you know, personally, I didn't have any issues getting suppressive therapy and I was on it for about a year. Okay. Um, what I have had difficulty with is being able to get a refill when I'm having an active outbreak. Really? Yeah, which is which is hard. And, and I guess it depends on the relationship that you have with your primary care provider. Right. And but let me let me actually look into the recommendations for suppressive therapy. Yeah. So that's interesting. I'm not seeing a lot regarding waiting until you have had three outbreaks in order to start suppressive therapy. Why would I want to wait two more times to have outbreaks? Exactly. Well, and you know, uh, we know that the first year after your primary infection is when you're going to have the most recurrences. And maybe that's that doctor's personal preference or his practice that he's in. But I, you know, I don't know that I had to wait three outbreaks before I got put on suppressive therapy. And especially, you know, early on in the infection, the the recurrences tend to be more severe. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, as a medical professional, yeah. I wouldn't want my patient to have to go through that and stuff. It's, it's not fun. Yeah. It's not going to like, you know, hide it. It's, it's painful, especially generally it hurts to pee, like, oh. <laughs> you know, normal things. Yeah. Are hard to oh. For me, swallowing and breathing were an issue. Like I didn't want to breathe very much because it would make my throat dry, which would cause me to swallow more. And it was so painful. I was like, basically, like, and that's why I didn't want to talk. And I felt like I couldn't respond to things because just movement of those muscles hurt so badly. Yeah. And like swallowing and breathing are kind of essential. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if, Unless that, unless you talk to that doctor and he has a really rock solid reason for not giving suppressive therapy, you know, you can always go get a second opinion. That's what I will have to do. I just have to wait a few weeks. And I, I wrote to my doctor as well. I was like, hey, this seems like a waste of your time and not a good use of the system, but uh, yeah. I'll come in person if I have to. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so we've covered there are eight types of herpes. We've covered how relatively easy they are to contract via contact. Can you just talk a little bit about mucous membranes? <laughs> yeah. So people who are female assigned at birth, you know, there's a lot more mucous membrane exposed via activity contact than for people who are male assigned at birth with a penis, you know? Um, so that does make female body people more susceptible to contracting HSV. And we do know that it is easier for the virus to be transmitted to a female-bodied person from a male-bodied person than it is for a male-bodied person to be infected from a female-bodied person. That That's not <laughs> fair. <laughs> it's not fair. You know, it's not. There's a lot of things that aren't fail, fair to female-bodied people. <laughs> That's so not fair. <laughs> Oh, and can you just tell us a little bit about how antivirals actually work? What do they do? So there are several different antiviral medications that can be used for herpes virus. Mm -hmm. So you have your acyclovir, which um, you have been taking, valcyclovir, which is um, what I was on for a long time for suppressive therapy. And is that Valtrex? What's Valtrex. the... Okay, okay. And then there's also famcyclovir, which I'm not as familiar with just because we don't use it as often as the other two. Okay. And they are pretty great in that they decrease the incidence of recurrence. They decrease the length of time that you have an outbreak, and they can also decrease the amount of shedding, making it less likely that you will infect your partner. So, you know, and these can be used as daily suppressive therapy or as just when you have an outbreak to help um, mitigate the symptoms that you're having. Okay. And then on that note of mitigating risk, let's talk a little bit more about condoms and dental dams and how effective those things actually can be when it comes to gifting this virus <laughs> to others. So we know that barrier protection works great for a lot of STIs. You know, um, they work great for preventing the spread of HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis. They work to an extent for herpes, but herpes is a little bit of 
uh, in its own realm because you can get it just from skin to skin contact. Right. And your condom is not covering all of your skin in that area, you know. And then, you know, there's also fluids and such that aren't always contained yeah. by the condom. So it, it definitely decreases the risk, but it's not foolproof when it comes to preventing herpes. Mm-hmm. Because you can get it on your thighs or your butt or your cheek or your it, wherever. Or your shoulder, anywhere. <laughs> so. Do we know why there isn't a vaccine for herpes HSV 1 and 2 like there is for chickenpox? There hasn't been one because it's they're tr- the herpes virus is a tricksy little Okay, bugger. so it's just a sneaky fucking virus. <laughs> it's sneaky. But... What? There is a new vaccine that is going through clinical trials right now. It just passed phase one trials so for safety. And with how long clinical trials take, I imagine it could be a, we're a long way out from actually production of this vaccine. Mm-hmm. But it's looking pretty hopeful that okay. this could be something that works. And there, there's also some some thought that potentially people who already have HSV, and this is an HSV2 specific yes. vaccine. There's also thought that possibly this vaccine could be given to people who already have HSV2 to help decrease recurrences. Ooh. So yes, people have been working on this for a long time. Okay. Um, we've been thwarted by this virus for a long time. Sneaky but, fucking virus. <laughs> But we are, the medical community is working on it. And now that we have something in, in phase one clinical trials, it's I'm pretty hopeful that eventually we will, we will have a vaccine. What do you think the best spot to get herpes is? HSV2. HSV2, if you're going to get it, you probably want it orally. because <gasps> Yay! <laughs> but, um, yeah, because you're getting... You're going to have less recurrences. It's going to be less severe. You're going to have less shedding. You need to try out some flavored condoms. Um, (laughs) What we define as patients who are at high risk um, in terms of their sexual behavior, it's men who have sex with men, people who do sex work, and people who have a lot of partners, whatever that is defined as. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I think think anything that is outside of a definitely monogamous relationship, there is some amount of risk. In absence of complete abstinence, yeah. there's going to be risk. Yeah. Going back to deep throating, like there's so many people out there with HSV-1 orally, and I'm sure a fair number of them are also participate in oral sex. Yeah. So, I mean, I, did, I, I had HSV-1, but I have been so vigilant if I have the slightest tingle because I get it at the corners of my mouth, I will like not kiss someone, not touch someone. I'll keep my drinks to myself. I guess I'm just worried that it's going to feel different and I won't recognize what HSV2 feels like and I won't know because it's in the back of my throat. And what if I get it and I can't see it or you know what I mean? Like, will I because I should if I have an outbreak, I should be able to see it theoretically. But if yeah. I'm shedding, I can't see a thing. Right. And, and that is, that's one of the things that kind of sucks about her is that, you know, you don't necessarily know when you're shedding in terms of, you know, I, I think for you personally, having HSV1 and now also having HSV2, I think you're really in tune with when you're going to have an HSV1 outbreak, you know, when that tingle hits Mm -hmm. that you need to be more careful. And I think just continuing that sort of vigilance is gonna be fine you know you we do know that hsv2 orally does not shed as much does not have as many outbreaks but you're still i would say you know the first year after the initial infection is really where you're going to see the most shedding and the most recurrence and if if antiviral therapy gives you greater peace of mind with regards to sharing (laughs) this virus i say go for it how does it it's an, I guess I can't draw straight lines. Like if I think I'm having an HSV one tingle, I'm probably also having an HSV two tingle. Like they pro- they don't necessarily have to line up, right? Maybe it doesn't matter. Well, I don't think you'll ever know which is which. Okay. Wow. Yeah. What a sneaky fucking virus. Unless you're getting an outbreak in a spot that's unusual for right. you, right. or you know feels different for you, maybe you'll be able to tell. You know, it's hard to say. 
But I, I think that the precautions you take when you're having an HSV-1 outbreak are going to work just fine for this as precautions for HSV-2. Okay. And do you want to share any of your own personal experience with HSV? I definitely went down the freak out rabbit hole for sure. I spent hours and hours every day researching herpes. And this was this was a long time before I started medical school. I didn't have access to medical journals. So I was getting the same information that the lay person is going to get f- just from Googling. Yeah. And a lot of scary stuff. There's a lot out there of random people, you know, because I was reading all kinds of forums. Like, if I have herpes, is anyone going to love me ever yeah. again? Well, that and it's like, there's a lot out there that where you have, whether they're trolls or just really close minded people saying like, Ew, you're gross. Never. And it's like, <gasps> that, yeah. And that really affected my self worth for a long time, especially, you know, the way that I contracted HSV1 genitally was that, well, that's actually how I discovered that my ex had been cheating on me. Mm, so that was great. A little surprise. <laughs> yes. And um, so did you discover from an outbreak? Yeah, I had an initial outbreak. Oh, fuck. And, and you know, the, the doctor that I saw at the time of the initial outbreak was like pretty sure that it was herpes. Mm-hmm. But again, I had a, had a long difficulty with getting actual positive test results. And <laughs> sometimes doctors don't have the best bedside manner. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I was pretty young when this happened and I immediately burst into tears when he told me this. Yeah. And sits there very awkwardly and says, Oh, do you need a hug? And I'm just like, not from you. <laughs> yeah, that's wow. Come on, people, as doctors, we need to be better. <laughs> yeah. Going down this rabbit hole and reading whatever Google had to say and reading what random people had to say about how I was less of a person because I had herpes, that really got to me. Yeah. I didn't date for a while. I eventually dated, but like cut things off way before anything could get serious because Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have that discussion. I didn't want to have that disclosure conversation. You're very vulnerable. And, you know, when I met my current partner, I had to have a little bit of liquid courage before I finally told him. And Mm -hmm. he was very accepting of it and really was just an an angel. (laughs) Can you actually share details of that with us if you feel comfortable? Yeah. So we had been dating for a couple months and it got to the point where I was like, all right, like I want a bone. Yeah. <laughs> and we had gone on this really nice date and I definitely, I knew I was like, it's time I got to tell him before this goes any further. And so had several drinks <laughs> and we get back to his bedroom and we're just talking, hanging out. And then, you know, I'm like, all right, I got to tell you something. And of course I burst into tears and he's like, what is going on? Yeah. And I told him, I was like, you know, I do have herpes genitally. It's HSV-1, so it's not as severe as HSV-2 genitally. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was on suppressive therapy. And he was like, okay, that's fine. We'll figure it out. And it really hasn't been an issue. When I do have an outbreak, we don't do any downstairs stuff. (laughs) And as time has gone on, I'm no longer on suppressive therapy. I rarely, rarely have outbreaks anymore. As far as I know, my partner has not had any outbreaks either. But yeah, it's very, very nerve wracking. But you got to rip the bandaid off at some point. And I think it is a good way to uh, find people who are good. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm hoping. Oh, and can you say how long have you guys been together? We have been together now for about four and a half years. Well, I find that very heartening. <laughs> yeah. And we do know that the stigma surrounding herpes really came out of big pharma trying to, yeah. <laughs> trying to sell Valtrex, which, you know, is unfortunate because prior to that, it was considered just a skin condition. Yeah. Dr. S, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. I hope that this helps you, helps your listeners and you know, if you have any concerns, go talk to your doctor. Hopefully they're good ones. (laughs) And now we are joined by a sex worker, Annika. Hi, Annika. Hi. Will you please tell us a little bit about your experience with herpes? Sure. Um, I've been a sex worker for 
over 10 years, so I have a lot of experience with it. And my experience with it really starts long before I started working because growing up, everybody has cold sores. Mm -hmm. And my parents were always really sure that I could have avoid herpes by just avoiding kissing people I didn't know on the lips or not sharing cups with people who weren't in my family. Mm -hmm. So nobody in your family has HSV-1? That's the funny thing. I'm pretty sure both of my parents do. <laughs> they just don't have that many cold sores? Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah. So, um, and I think they were really careful about sharing utensils or anything. They were even a little bit I'm going to say superstitious about mm. making sure that, you know, if I was at somebody's house and I wasn't sure that things were washed well, right, that there was a transmission risk of that. So just to be clear, you do not have HSV-1. I am somehow in my fourth decade of life and do not have HSV-1 or HSV-2. Okay. Well, I have both of them in my mouth now, but I've had HSV-1 for ages, and I didn't realize until I had my first boyfriend that there was even stigma around HSV-1. People never talk about the fact that cold sores are herpes, and herpes is cold sores. N nobody talks about the fact that chickenpox is herpes. You know, one of the things that my mom told me when I was a kid that I more recently brushed up on is just how many people have it. It's 62% of all Americans and 82% of Americans over age 60. Wow. That, is that HSV-1 only? No, it's the HSV-1 and 2, right? We're not talking about chicken pox right now, but it's everybody. Everybody has it. Statistically, the person that you're with has it. And, you know, my immune system isn't great. Mm -hmm. And through a combination of luck and vigilance, I have avoided getting it. But people lie. People don't get tested as often as they should. People forget about what's risky. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm not going to forget about what's risky or get lied to or uh, slip up. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's likely statistically that I'm going to wind up in my 60s and still not have it. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I'm most concerned about is if you're going to get it and be pregnant, you don't want to get it while you're pregnant because there's a likelihood that you will have an outbreak while giving birth mm -hmm. and then that transmission can kill the baby. In which case they do typically recommend a cesarean section. Right. So... I just don't want to contract it while I'm pregnant. I'm happy to contract it before I'm pregnant. I'm happy to contract it after I have babies. And what do you think about possibly if you had to choose a place to get it, where would you choose? Where would I choose? I'm um, just saying I think I'm pretty excited that I have HSV-2 in my throat since it hates living there. Yeah, it doesn't love living there, so it's probably not going to break out as often. Yeah, if ever. A lot of people who have it in their throat never get it again is what I've learned. I think I would be pretty likely to have frequent outbreaks because my immune system doesn't work great if I had HSV-1 orally. I think that if I had it on and it was breaking out on my lips, it would be more of a disruption in my quality of life. Whereas I have a lot of confidence that whoever belongs in my intimate circle and gets to interact with my genitals consensually, that we can have an understanding that like, oh, this week I'm just not having sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, it would be less disruptive, even though I work with my genitals. And it would be more painful. Yeah, it, it is supposed to be more painful. Yeah. Um, I also have a lot of faith in suppressive therapies. Mm. Um, you know, Valtrex has a risk of increasing dissociation. So for people who have certain health issues, it can be less of a good idea. Mm. But I've been taking Valtrex prophylactically when I think I might have been exposed. Within an hour afterwards, I take a double dose. Oh, really? If I think I'm going into a risky situation or if I'm going to a sex party or if I'm with someone I don't fully trust but I'm choosing to have the encounter anyway, I'll take two Valtrex before. The encounter. And to help our listeners understand, taking it beforehand does not stop you no, from no, no, getting no, no. a virus. No, it reduces the risk. So all of the all of the statistics around transmissibility are 
uh, fractions and percentages about what happens epidemiologically over a large population, right? In a large population, X number uh, didn't contract it after they did this. Now, I don't know anything, listener, about your immune system. I don't know anything about your health history. I don't know anything about your genes and how they're going to interact with the drug. I don't know anything about how much sleep you get. I don't know any, anything about how much chocolate you ate that day, right? Herpes loves to eat arginine. About how vigorously you were deep-throating. <laughs> right, or having vaginal sex, or dry humping. Yeah. Uh, you know, dry humping when somebody's asymptomatically shedding if you get really vigorous on a thigh, the that nerve cluster down there can easily be harboring some HSV2, and you can catch it. Uh, mucous membranes are very, very penetrable. And vigorous rubbing on skin that's either asymptomatically or symptomatically shedding, and remember, two days before and two days after any kind of outbreak, you are actively shedding. Mm-hmm. So it's not possible. It's just not possible to make your risk zero unless you have one partner and that partner has one partner and you trust that, which frankly you shouldn't. I was going to say, I don't. You just shouldn't. I don't. (laughs) Although I don't have to worry anymore. (laughs) Listeners out there who, who think that their monogamous partner is monogamous, I may have slept with your partner. So do you have any partners that you know of who have herpes, either kind? Oh, um, do I have any partners right now who have either kind of herpes? Or ever. I have a prospective partner who has HSV-1 orally. Mm -hmm. And none of my current partners have any kind of HSV, which really surprises me. I'm realizing it as I say it. That's almost never the case. I always have at least one or two. Okay. Because it's so many people just statistically. And part of the reason that I know that is that I am really rigorous about having conversations with partners before we engage. And I have had, I can't count, I honestly can't count how many conversations with people where they've not thought about herpes since eighth grade health class, and they get tested for it for the first time because I won't touch them until they do. Can you talk a little bit about what that conversation goes like? So I'll say something like, okay, I'm having a really good time, but I want us to be grown-ups for a second, and I want us to talk about STI risk because I want to be intimate with you, and I want to feel safe, and I want to trust you, and so there's just some things that I need to know for my safety and for the safety of my other partners. And that part, they're usually always okay with. Mm -hmm. Um, That part, they're like, oh, that's nice. Sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm usually the person to bring up this conversation. I'm I'm so grateful that you do. Mm -hmm. And then a couple minutes later, I realize whatever conversations they're having with their partners are really not sufficient. At what point do you typically have these conversations with them? Before we kiss. And if a kiss happens before we have the conversation because it feels right and it feels great and we're in a situation where that boundary has been, where it's clearly an enthusiastic consent on both sides, Mm -hmm. then I might pop a Valtrex after that kiss when I get home. Mm. Do you have the conversation with them right away after you kiss, or do you wait until the next time, or what do you do? It depends on what's happened uh, and what's likely to happen. But certainly once there's been a kiss, I'm very likely to have that conversation at that same meeting. Mm -hmm. But usually I try to do it before, because if somebody's not willing to engage in that conversation with me, no matter how hot they are, no matter what a good client they might be, or what a good partner they might be, I can't trust them. That's a great point. Thanks. I mean, it's been really hard. It's been one of the processes for me of growing up, of saying, like, who's worth my time Mm -hmm. and who's not worth my time? Mm -hmm. And people I can't trust go to the back of the line. Yeah. Because if 50% of long-term monogamous partners are cheating on each other, which the number fluctuates depending on who you ask, between 50 and 60 statistically, that's as likely as divorce, right? Mm -hmm. How many of your friends' parents are divorced or how many of your friends are divorced? It's that many people who think that their partners are faithful who aren't. And if if people are willing to lie about that, which is like a primary agreement in people's lives, then 
Why wouldn't they be willing to lie about how recently they got tested or what was on the test? Totally. So in those conversations that you're having with your partners, how do you feel safe even as you're having the conversation? Because I had a conversation with my partner. Now, looking back on it, I've shared why I think there are some red flags there. But even when you do all of your due diligence, what is it that needs to be in place for you to feel totally safe? I want to know where they got the test done. I insist that they get tested for HSV-1 and HSV-2. Mm -hmm. I disclose my negative status for both of them and tell them that I want to keep it that way. I want to offer something to the world. I read recently that it's really nice to use the language clear. Like, clear. I'm all clear. Yeah. Instead I don't of like clean. positive, negative, clean. Yeah, because that has a bad connotation. Yeah, the opposite Because it means that you're dirty. dirty. But clear means I'm just all clear, ready for takeoff, ready for landings, yeah. <laughs> ready for whatever... I like negative because it's about viral status mm -hmm. and it's not about um, your worth as a person. I also understand that it has a quote unquote negative, negative connotation. connotation. So. <laughs> it is what your test says when you get it yeah. back. Yeah, I disclose my status and I tell them before they ever get tested that I've had long-term partners before with HSV, mm -hmm. that having HSV doesn't mean that we don't get to have sex. Mm -hmm. It just means that I get to protect myself and we get to take risks that I know about, which is how I prefer my risks. I prefer my risks consensual. When we are protecting each other from HSV, we're protecting each other from, usually, with the exception of pregnancy, just extreme discomfort. Do you want your fuck friend, your lover, to be in severe pain? It's also, you know, your experience, as I understand it, has been pain. For some people who are in industries where they're very visible, it, it matters whether or not they have an outbreak on their face. Yeah. For some people who are in very religious contexts, uh, certainly if you're fucking around with somebody who's not supposed to be fucking you, uh, if they have a very religious background or community, them showing up with an STI can be really hard on them. Mm -hmm. And so, and also if somebody's immunocompromised, which if you haven't had a conversation about STIs, you probably also don't know their immunostatus. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody's immunocompromised, it can mean fatigue. It can mean cognitive difficulty. It can mean some stuff that is a little bit more serious. And yeah. so, you know, yeah, I love your question of like, do you want your friend to go through that? Or not even friend, any human being. I mean, unless you have a specific fetish for this, I assume you're not out to fuck monsters. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> so given that, even if you feel neutral about a person, say you're someone that loves stranger play, do you want a random stranger to experience all of those possibilities? I don't. Yeah. So... You make them show you their actual test? I prefer to see an actual test result. And that is tricky when you're working with clients. Yeah. I have I lose most of my clients before we get to what people think of as the sex work mm -hmm. because of this conversation. And I'm in a privileged position. I'm not working cars in the middle of the night mm -hmm. right off the highway, right? Yeah. And so I'm not here to say morally everybody should be doing what I'm doing. I have the luxury of time and I screen. But yeah, I prefer to see test results. I can think of partners where I haven't seen the test results, but I have trusted them. Okay. Because we have a conversation. I see the surprise on their face. I see them working through things. Mm -hmm. Usually I'm the person who is educating them about a lot of common STIs and the fact that they don't have to be symptomatic for them to have them. Yeah. I'm also in a very lucky position in that I've never had gonorrhea or chlamydia, but I've had multiple of these conversations with people where, and these are the people I trust the most, they get a test and it turns out they have something mm -hmm. and they can't figure out where they would have gotten it. Oh, really? It's unclear how long they've had it. Because they haven't had sex in one or two or three years. Oh, wow. And yeah. they weren't having symptoms. No symptoms. Wow. Not every STI is symptomatic. In fact, most people who get diagnosed with HSV, um, I for I'm forgetting the number. It is an astonishing number. Oh, yes. It's a very sneaky virus. There's a book called Managing Herpes, Living and Loving with HSV. 
They talk about, first of all, how much having a conversation reduces your risk of transmission. And obviously, that's correlation, not causation, right? Mm -hmm. But second, they really talk about how um, most people who get diagnosed have actually never, or a sizable percentage, I think it's, it's at least 40% of people who get diagnosed, have literally never noticed symptoms. And wow. then there's a phenomenon that within, it's either two weeks or two months, they get their quote-unquote first outbreak. That actually happened with Whoa. a partner of mine. I insisted that he get tested before we ever did anything unprotected. I never, I never gave him an unprotected blowjob, and I, ex I explained why. And that was really the carrot. Clarification. Did you give him a blowjob with protection? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Can you tell me what that's like and what, what flavor condom you use or what kind of condom you use? Because I hate the way the gross regular ones taste. I won't use latex condoms for blowjobs. Yeah, they're because they're yucky. Because of the taste. Um, I also don't do that well with latex. Okay. So I use non-latex condoms and there is lube on the lifestyles and the trojans that i don't like the taste of there is a brand of non-latex condom called unique they're made in britain they are very very thin polypropylene they're like sandwich bag material and the sensation on them is great and what i do is i put some lube inside the tip of the condom because i'm not worried about it slipping off inside my vulva mm -hmm. I put some lube inside the tip of the condom and that drastically increases their sensation because they can feel the sheath rubbing against the penis. And mm. then the lube on that is tasteless. I think if I weren't doing Unique, Uniques are expensive. They're about seven fifty a pack and a pack only has three. So oh, they're, they're about two fifty a pack. Okay. But if you're if you're doing it for a living mm -hmm. Or it's a good you, investment. Or if you really value your sex life, you know, I use uniques in my personal life, then mm. it's really worth it. You know, two fifty for a great blowjob. I don't know anybody who Question that. though. I don't know that I feel even safe doing that. Well, remember Because it can get other parts of them. Sure. So remember that the area that's infected and shedding has to be the thing where friction is happening. Yeah, deep right? throating. I you're deep be... throating, but you're deep throating on a condom, right? So yes, it but is But saliva gets around. That's true. That's right? It's true. not perfect. That, that's just it's, what oh, I'm... it's not perfect. It's never perfect. I mean, it's never perfect, I but... I mean, you can look at a million public cases of athletes giving somebody... HSV and that person having a terrible outbreak, yeah. suing the athlete. And the athlete always asserts, I was wearing a condom. And the lawyer always asserts, condoms aren't worth anything in this. Somewhere in the middle lies truth. Yeah. Um, I think for you, because you happen to have it in the throat, your risk of transmission is, I don't know, maybe a little bit higher than my risk of contraction because it's not like saliva from their penis is going to reach around the condom and infect me. Um, but yeah, I put... Lube in the tip of the condom. I prefer certain brands of condoms. If it's not unique, I like Durex. They have an, a non-latex condom that doesn't taste too bad. Um, do yourselves a favor and never use Trojan non-latex. They're awful. They're so thick. Everybody hates them. Okay, good good, good yeah, pro tip. It's, it's a really important, literally a pro tip. I'm still unpacking what you just said about HSV being less likely. Oh, the, assuming that it's on their actual penis. Right. I well, see. so... What's what's experiencing friction when I'm giving a blowjob, and I'm not as good at deep throating as you are. Um, we haven't had a contest. I I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I'm thinking about where the friction is occurring, which is your throat, and. The fact that even saliva, which might have active virus on it, is just going to sit on their skin, right? Scrotal skin, genital area skin that's not the tip of a... But that could also get infected. It can. I'm not saying it can't. Yeah. I'm saying it's a lower risk than if, for instance... Okay. I'm just trying to be to... very clear yes, about important. zero important versus... Clear. Because people are reassuring me, and I do feel reassured, but 1.3% in four days a year is still four days a year of viral shedding after two years, and that makes yeah. me nervous. I'm... And if you're having sex once a week, you know, do the math. Yeah. Um, it's possible. Yeah. So... No, I'm not saying it's zero risk. I'm running the numbers in my head and I'm going, that 
genital area is not experiencing any friction, and the only, you know, m- mucous membranes, lips, mouth, throat. A lot more susceptible. Genitals, a lot more susceptible just by fluid yeah. exchange. Yeah, people who are assigned female at birth or who have a lot of mucous membrane contact that's sexual with um, any possibly infected area are more likely to contract. But I'm thinking about where the friction is and where the potentially infected saliva is going to end up. And I like my chances on giving a blowjob with a condom where I'm not contacting any skin with my mucous membranes. I like those chances. I like those odds. Even giving a protected blowjob takes a certain amount of trust Mm. because I I need to trust that if the condom breaks, I'm not going to not sleep for two weeks and also not be able to make money for two weeks while I wait for my test results or, you know, you know, it's disruptive. One thing that I was thinking about when you were talking earlier about seeing your partner's tests is you, there's still an immense amount of trust that must be necessary because who the fuck knows what happened after they got the test? Yeah. And who the fuck knows? I love looking at the date on the test. Looking at the date, but also you don't know who they've seen in between. And you don't know who they saw right before because not Absolutely everything shows not. up right away. That's why I try to have ethical non-monogamy conversations with everybody at the same time that we're having testing conversations. And I know it's not foolproof. Yeah. Period. There is risk. Even if you have two people that are really like doing everything correctly and trying their hardest because so many things are a little bit sneaky, I think that's why the stigma and the shame hurt my heart so much. Yeah, I think that it's not like if you contract it, you did a bad job. And I think that's the first thing that people go to, right? They want feelings of control and they go, what should I have done differently? What can I do differently in the future? right? And sometimes people are irresponsible and it affects you and there's nothing you can do. I can think of multiple situations in my past where if I were thinking of it as a moral issue, I would think I deserve to have herpes by now, Mm -hmm. right? I should. Statistically, I I should have it. I was talking about this partner that, you know, I gave protected blowjobs to and he got his test results back and he was floored that he had herpes. Because he had never, ever in his life Did had it, HSV1 or two? He had HSV1 genitally. And his doctor, like most doctors in my experience, put up a fight about him getting a test. Most insurance won't pay for a test unless the patient says, and everybody listen to this, these are the magic words, I think I've been exposed recently. Oh, that is what I said. I didn't realize that I had to say that. Those are the magic words. Insurance companies don't want anybody tested unless there's an outbreak that is, you know, suspected to be herpes, in which case they want a swab and not a blood test for understandable reasons. But if you go to the doctor and you say, I want a blood test for this, I think I've been exposed, uh, they'll give it to you. They might put up a fight. They might say something like, well, everybody has some herpes Mm -hmm. or... They might say something like, oh, herpes isn't a big deal, and you probably have HSV-1 from childhood anyway, so, you know, why do the test? I've heard all kinds of things between clients and partners and and my own experiences with doctors. Now, I just walk into the office, I say, I want a full panel, and I want HSV-1 and HSV-2 on it. And also, because I'm white, I have to mention HIV. I've been frequently discouraged from getting HIV tested. Really? Yes. I've never been discouraged from I've it. I've been discouraged from I'm getting, like, give me everything. I've been, getting dis- I've been discouraged from getting HIV tests because racism is built systematically into the medical system. Mm-hmm. And they look at a white person and they assume that they're not having sex with people in high-risk populations. And that's absolutely false. Huh. I've had it said to me. Wow. Um, the, the history of racism in medicine is really, I want to say mind blowing, but it's not, it's similar to the history of racism in every other area of this country's history. And so it's really important to protect yourself and to expect doctors to have all of the same prejudices or worse than the rest of the population and to go get the care that you need. And I just want to add there talking about blood tests and versus swabs. If you have a sore, you get it swapped. If you have a sore, you get it swabbed. That's what happened to me. I got my results same day. And that doesn't mean, 
If the sore comes back negative with a swab, that doesn't mean you don't have herpes, by the way. There are false negatives on that test. I know people who've had outbreaks, had swabs, come ba- had them come back negative. I've said, go get a blood test. They get the blood test, blood test comes back positive. Whoa. Yeah. People think about false negatives and false positives like, oh, well, but I have my result. So if they get the result that they want, they think, oh, I must not be one of those. I would think that. Yeah. I mean, that is literally what I've thought every time I've had all of my full panel of tests and had everything come back negative. One of the things that the doctors say about the HSV tests, and they're absolutely right, is there are false positives and false negatives. It's not a particularly accurate test. Do you think mine is a false positive? I'm not not. a doctor. (laughs) I, I know I know what happened to you, and I know that that guy was irresponsible. Well, something I was thinking about, too, is it seems likely that that is what happened. But we don't know for sure. But we don't know for sure. Well, What if, if I was he, a secret sneaky carrier, or he was, or you know what I mean? Like, what if it, what if, just what if? I think that if we lived in a society where we didn't ascribe moral value to a STI status then we would have a chance at openly communicating with partners and having them say, oh, yeah, after that I did get tested, and guess what? I'm positive for that, too. Mm -hmm. And I called the person I thought who gave it to me, had them get tested. They were positive. They're zero, right? You would have a shot at that. I will say the last three partners I had at least claimed to have negative. I I saw one. I trusted one. I trusted the other one. Knowing what's out there in terms of people's receptivity to talking about testing, I don't blame you for trusting people. I honestly don't. That, I mean, that's the thing. It is so much emotional labor to initiate the conversation in the first place. And sometimes you just want to get fucked. Uh, most of the time I just want to get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's due diligence, but it's like I'm doing it so I can be done. Yeah. yeah. And so this partner that I had who had never been tested before, hadn't been tested in years because they have so few sexual partners, Mm -hmm. they were floored that they had a genital infection. Did they feel sad? They felt sad. They felt worried. They were worried they were going to lose me. Oh, no. And they Mm -hmm. didn't. And we wound up in a relationship for more than a few years. Okay. And we were careful. I took my prophylactic therapy when it was relevant. Mm-hmm. We, when was it relevant? It was relevant whenever he hadn't, any night that he hadn't slept a full night. And okay. we were going to have contact until he oh felt better. Oh my God, I'm going to have to be so careful with my health. It, well, it depends I mean, I on, am sometimes. It depends on how sexually active you are. You know, any time that he had taken a flight. Right. Right. Any time that he'd done anything that would lower your immune defenses. If he was going through a really stressful time at work, I would be more careful. And then if there was any tingling, within two weeks of getting his positive diagnosis, he had his first outbreak in his life that he remembers. So he was one of these members of this phenomenon. And I didn't read about it until years later. Any other thoughts on herpes? You know, it's a skin condition. Mm -hmm. And something about that really put me at ease. Like psoriasis. Yeah. Well, it's like psoriasis, but it's less likely to... After the two-year period of initial emotional adjustment, which, again, that's epidemiological. It might take you a lot less time to adjust. Mm -hmm. Um, But after the initial period of adjustment, it's likely to interfere with your life a lot less than psoriasis. I... I mean, I don't love all of the doctor-perpetuated fear and silence and secrecy around it. I don't love that I've heard from many, many people that my, their doctors encourage them that they don't have to disclose their status. What? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I once had a doctor. I, didn't, I sort of didn't believe that doctors were out there saying that until I experienced it myself. I had a doctor say, well, even if it comes up positive, it's not like you're going to tell anybody. What? And I said, don't you think that people should disclose their status? I thought you were supposed to. Well, supposed to according to whose ethics? Doctors aren't lawyers. But is there? I, there, I don't need to Google are, this. There are doctors who encourage their patients to not disclose it because everybody has it and most people don't know. And you'll 
risk your chances. Th- this stigma runs deep. We gotta kill the stigma. Yeah. Do you want to have a practice STI convo with me? Yeah. Okay. So, I really like you. Oh, I like you too. <laughs> and um, I really want to touch you a lot. I love being touched. In a lot of places. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like lots of touches. Um, and you know, I have other partners. Mm-hmm. And not everybody would say that, right? Not everybody has other partners. Right. For me. Or oftentimes they do, but they don't say it. Right. Um, so I would say, you know, you know, I have other partners and it's really important for me to keep myself safe and for me to keep them safe and for me to keep you safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I like you. Yeah. I so like I want to talk about STIs. Okay. Um, I was last tested about six months ago and I came back negative for everything. I got tested for HIV and HSV1 and HSV2. And all of my ongoing partners have been tested uh, within the last six months, and they all came back negative for all of those things. And they're in closed loops. Okay. And so they don't have sex with other people unless we talk about it first, or if they have sex with other people and we haven't talked about it, then we have a conversation before we have sex again. Okay. And you trust those partners? Oh, yeah. Okay. I trust them. Okay. Okay. But it's not a zero-risk situation. And Anytime you're having sex with people, it's yeah. not. Yeah. And so um, in order to keep the risk low, it's really important to me to have these conversations and have them regularly. Okay. Well, I would like to tell you, I was recently tested last Monday, and I am a carrier. What's the best way to say it? I have. What's the nicest way to say it? I positive. For I'm a HSV2. champion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a proud warrior of HSV 1 and 2, and with my warrior status, I want to ensure that I diminish all risk of sharing that with you. Okay. Um, Both of those things are in my mouth. Do you, oh, okay. So you have HSV 1 H- and HSV 2 orally? So HSV 1, yes, I have it, it, it. When I get it, it's on the edge of my lips. HSV 2 lives in the back of my throat. Oh, and I'm okay. currently finishing up an outbreak of it. So okay. I think my mouth is currently a no-go situation. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to learn more about how shedding and saliva interact so that we can kiss safely. But I, yeah. I really want to kiss you sometime. That would be great. Yeah. So it's not – I'm learning too, and I'm actually getting a lot of conflicting uh, responses around saliva. Because some things say direct contact with a sore is the thing that you need to be worried about. But there is shedding that happens. And since I was, since I'm a new owner of this virus, of HSV2 specifically, HSV1 I've had for quite a while. And I'm really good at knowing when I'm about to have an outbreak. So I can tell you with all my partners who haven't had HSV1, they still don't have it. Because I'm really, really vigilant when it comes to that tingle and the cold sore thing. And I don't let my mouth touch parts anywhere when I feel a tingle. Okay, well, that takes care of symptomatic shedding, and asymptomatic shedding is going to be a risk. Yeah, it always will be. Have you ever thought about suppressive therapy? So I'm currently taking a Ciclovir, and that's this is my first dose of it, and I have an appointment with my doctor tomorrow to talk about what suppressive therapy I might explore. Well, I'm not a doctor, so you should talk to your doctor about this. Um, I've heard that a Ciclovir is less... Uh, it's less effective than valaciclovir by a significant percentage. Um, so you might want to check that out for yourself. I do want to check that out because I just got it from urgent care. I think the, the information on that is pretty public. A lot of doctors have a habit of prescribing a ciclovir, but I, I'm pretty sure that valaciclovir is markedly more effective. That's why I'm having a new doctor's appointment because cool, the, the urgent care doctor that I saw was super cool. And then by the time I got somebody else on the phone, because I was in another state and it was a whole run around, this lady was grumpy Yeah, and didn't seem to want to talk me through my HSV too. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm having an appointment with a doctor that hopefully is a little more positive. We'll see. Well, I mean, there are lots of places that I can kiss you and that we can kiss that don't have to do with your mouth. Great. And we don't have to wait to kiss or touch or have a really good time before we get this information. But I don't, what? We do have to wait to kiss because, well, oh, you to kiss can kiss each me. Mouths. Got it, got it, got it. 
Do you feel safe with me kissing you on places? I would feel safe with you gently kissing, not biting, like, not rubbing a like lot. Lip. My neck, my nipples, my shoulders. I'm not worried about you transmitting herpes to those places without a lot of friction. Okay. You know? So, and I would probably yeah. be most comfortable because I'm also concerned with my anxiety levels yeah. in the experience because I am anxious about it. Yeah. Because it's new to me, but I probably just would not really want my saliva around very okay. much because I yeah, feel nervous. Yeah, and we would never have to do anything that you weren't comfortable with. Well, likewise, I hope so. Yeah. So you just got tested two weeks ago. Uh, do you have any other partners? I stopped seeing all my partners. Okay. <laughs> well, if you get new partners, you know, just let me know as it's happening. Oh, and of course. I would. You, I mean, you know, sometimes it's late and you opt in and then you're like, oh, I told that person that I would uh, let them know. Is it okay that I'm letting them know after the fact? And then sort of a delaying thing happens. Mm. I don't want you to worry. You can just text me a two-word text that says, new partner, and then we can talk about it later when Great. you have time. Great. Yeah, perfect. Oh, I had stories that I wanted to tell. Oh, tell. They're short. Please do. Okay, one is when I was, gosh, I think about 18, 17 or 18, I had a friend, and he came back from Florida with a huge outbreak on his face. Mm. And it was kind of hidden under his facial hair, like he had carefully grown his facial hair over it, mm. so he was a little bit more stubbly than usual. And I was like, hey are you okay? And he was like, oh yeah, these are just my sun blisters. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, whenever I'm like out in the sun for a long time, I get these sun blisters. And I was like, I think you have herpes and you should get that checked out. Yeah. And I think I was tactful about it, you know, to the extent that I could be while letting him know, but he was very surprised and very offended. And the outbreak lasted for weeks. And eventually he went and got tested. And I don't know how many people he kissed in that time. Oh, jeez. But he had had doctors for years telling him they were sun blisters, that they were. I've also heard the them sun. called fever blisters. Yeah, fever yeah. blisters. Well, exposure to a lot of sun in the area, or not in the area, can encourage an outbreak. Mm -hmm. But there are people out there who don't know that their cold sores are herpes. And don't know that their sun blisters are herpes. Yeah. And so one of the questions that I ask, you know, if this conversation had gone differently, right? If I had said, have you been tested recently? And they said, yes. And, and they said, I don't have anything, right? I would then ask follow-up questions. And I have to say, so have you been tested recently for HSV1 and HSV2? Yes. And they would say yes. And I would say, can I see? Yeah. Right? Because... They hear HSV, they think HIV. Yep. Right? Yes, it's that true. happens all the time. Yeah. Or they'll say, no, 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 I don't have any herpes. And I'll say, well, have you ever had a cold sore even when you were a kid? And frequently they will say yes. Mm -hmm. And I will say, okay, that's probably HSV1. Like, let's get you tested and find out if you also have HSV2. And their minds are blown. Yeah. But it was that guy. I have that guy to thank. Just a, a platonic friend. We never had sexual contact. I had him to thank for like, this is someone I love who I trust, mm -hmm. who I spend a lot of time with, who I share values with, who just never got educated about this communicable disease that he carries and, you know, is very contagious with a good percentage of the time. He spent a, a good amount of time in Florida. <laughs> so... it's a great story. <laughs> thank you. Another one. Okay, so once I was at a friend's house and we were working on something and... We were sharing, like, chips and dip, mm -hmm. and his apartment was kind of dim, and at the end of the night, he, like, turned on his lights, and I saw a cold sore on his corner of his lip, and it was, like, in the, in the raspberry phase, right? It wasn't in the crusty phase yet, even. It's fresh. Yeah. And I was like, hey, uh, what's that on your lip there? And he was like, oh, it's a cold sore. And I was like, immediately my mind is racing. Homeboy does not have a dishwasher, right? So everything's hand washed. How good is he at washing things oh, and man. soaping them up? I've okay. been using his dishes. And I've been sharing dip with him. And I start getting psychosomatic tingles immediately. Mm hmm and I go home, 
and I take my Valtrex, and I'm thinking, I was there for hours. This is not an hour or two after exposure. Like, this is well after that. I'm screwed. Mm. I was fine. But, like, he screwed up. And we had a conversation afterwards where he was like, wow, you're making this a really big deal. And I was like, no, I'm really not. I'm immunocompromised. And it's your responsibility to tell people. Yeah. And he was a friend. Of Don't so share food it. when you have an outbreak. Yeah. It's okay. And, and that's not adding to stigma. That's, you're a warrior for your friends. Yeah. 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 I had a, I had a partner once who, I was super drunk. I was so, so drunk, and I still busted out the STI conversation. It was, <laughs> I mean, I was a kid. So, you got anything? Yeah. <laughs> I, he, wanted, he wanted to uh, do something risky without a condom, and I said, I don't know anything about your testing status. And he said, I only fuck nice girls. Oh. Now, I still had sex with him. I still wanted to have sex with him. I was young. I was drunk. And I made a note to self that I would never have sex with him again. But I put a condom on him, and I had sex with him. Right? That is not an answer. (laughs) No. And it's something that's happened sort of so many times since to me, and now I don't have sex with them. That's what's out there. Do you want to play a game with me? Yeah. Will you be a dude who is pressuring me to give him a blowjob without a condom? Okay. I don't think we should. Will you just put the tip in your mouth? I really don't think that's a good idea. I mean, just a little bit. Just a little bit. No, I'm not going to. I mean, what if you just, like, jerk me off with one hand and then just lick the tip? Ugh, that sounds so good, but I don't think we should do it. Um... I mean, I really want to, and I went down on you for like an hour. I know, and you're so fucking good at it, but I just, no, no, we can't. Well, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, there are so many, we could put a condom on and do it. You put condoms on for blowjobs? Yeah. I've never had a, I'm 42 years old, and I've never had a blowjob with a condom. That's ridiculous. You really want to? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Now you have throat herpes. <laughs> or now you have... Oh, damn it. <laughs> I gave you my herpes. Is it always throat herpes no matter where it goes? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Apparently. That's what my subconscious thinks. Like, that's the shift yeah. that we need to make. It's not like, oh, babe, let me. It's like, let's be safe and sexy. Just risk aware. Because there's no such thing as safe. And if you want to have sex with somebody who's not risk aware, I get it. I've done it. I'm not judging you. And also, you know, you need to be aware that you're taking a risk. Most people, they adjust when they learn that they have a new skin condition. Mm -hmm. But you don't know how much it might hurt the person you're giving it to. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I want to leave you with is just, just because you're okay with your status And I think you should be. Mm -hmm. No matter what you have, I think you should be okay with your status. I think you should, you know, get the medical care that your trauma doesn't prevent you from getting, right? Be kind to yourself. Find friends who support you. Yeah. Um, Do what you can. It's okay. But when we're talking about how it's going to impact other people, be rigorous. Be more rigorous than you were with yourself. And also remember... That some people got it being molested as kids, and some people got it, uh, you know, being circumcised, and some people got it a million different ways, right? Some people got it off a glass when they were a kid, or being kissed by their aunt when they were four, right? People get it all different kinds of ways, and if you're trying to find a partner without herpes, I mean, good luck. Uh, Honestly, I'm... I'm kind of marveling that mine don't have any right now, but, like, that's weird. That's not normal. Most people think they don't have it and actually do. So. I will say, I saw a friend last night I haven't seen in a while, and they were like, how are you? I was like, good. I found out I have throat herpes, and they were like, everyone I know has herpes. (laughs) Yeah. And I 
was so refreshing. Yeah, they're right. (laughs) (laughs) Annika, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Friends, now you know why I am thankful for throat herpes. It's a pretty good place overall if you have to have HSV2 to get it. So I'm hoping I can keep getting enough sleep and cut down on my stress levels enough that I never have to deal with an outbreak again. All I have to deal with is the sneaky shedding. That's our episode for this week. I am Wildly, creator, host, and sharer of sex stories. You can find me on Instagram at Wildly. Tony Reese is our co-producer, and he is at Tony Types. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Sex Stories Pod, and if you want to share a story or be a guest, uh, write us there through our website, sexstoriespodcast.com. My goal is to make this podcast as inclusive as possible, so if you're listening and have a different background than the guests you've heard so far, I especially encourage you to write to me if you want to. Or if you have a friend who wants to be on, or perhaps a grandma or grandpa, I'm totally interested in voices of all kinds. Please, connect us. If you like the podcast, if you want to join me in the battle against bad sex, or if you just want to help me make more films like Art is My Mistress, visit patreon.com slash wildly and join me there. Lovers. Friends. Fuckers. Sexual health conversations don't have to be hard. Everything I read online says it will be. Brace yourself. You might get a bad reaction. People might react poorly. It's going to be a hard conversation. But what if we just decided that it was fine? What if we decided it was normal? What if we laughed our way through the awkwardness as we all worked together to do a paradigm shift? I beg you, talk about your sexual health before you fuck. Do your due diligence because STIs are uncomfortable and a waste of time. Is having throat herpes the end of my world? No. Do I wish I didn't have it? Yeah, of course. So use me as an example if you don't want to bring up the conversation. You're like, hey, my friend, this person I know, this podcast I listen to, she talks about things explicitly all the time and still got throat herpes. Let's talk about that because I don't want to get it because she said it's really uncomfortable. And she said it's such a sneaky virus. I, I don't care. Let me, know, let me know if you do. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> do whatever you have to do to make that conversation feel okay for you. And then... With or without STIs, I really, really hope you go out and share a sex story.